All right, we've been doing Church on the Beach for a long time, like 10 years as an outreach in the summers and eight years year round. So it's been so fun just to go through the Bible and read what it has to say. So we've been through half of Genesis, all of Acts, all of Romans, and now we're almost through first Californians, Corinthians. So, today we're, con we're going to continue this study. The last chapter we looked at was a famous love chapter before Easter, chapter 13. By the way, how are you all doing on those attributes? Love is patient, love is kind. You know, how are you all doing? Well, just ask Jesus for help. He will help you. That is a, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. That will happen. And you know, the cool thing about that is, as someone showed me, when you open up an orange or a tangerine, it's like each of those slices are the different attributes. So it's one fruit. So when you have the Holy Spirit, you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and all those slices are love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, right? So you already have all that. It's just a matter of application. Isn't that cool? It's like U 2.0, right? It's like U 2.0. The improved version as Daniel was talking about uh, a minute ago. So we're going to turn to chapter 14 and learn about prophecy, tongues, and order in the church. And before I start, I'd like to pray. Uh, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to open your word. I pray you'll under, help us understand it, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Open our mind to understand your scriptures. Help us to apply it to our lives. Because I know the word goes in and divides bone and, bone and marrow and, and goes into those deepest places and shows us our next step in life. So do that for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so everybody have your owner's manual? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Bible. Uh, phones are okay as long as you're not scrolling Instagram during the message or do Snapchat. Um, I have the phone police here looking around. Now. I also teach school, so I'm used to the phone thing, right? I actually sub now. I, I was full-time. I retired. So now I just take roll and hover around the classroom. And it's much easier than doing lesson plans and calling parents. Um, so, verses 1 through 5 of chapter 14 in 1 Corinthians. Okay. Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for edification, exhortation, and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but rather that you would prophesy, and greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edification. Now if you're not familiar with tongues, there's a difference between a prayer language where you're just praying in moans and groans and things that only the Spirit understands, and then there's actual languages that we pray in. God gives us actual languages, which is a mystery to me. But the Bible says it. I've been around it. I've experienced it. I've heard it. It's real, okay? And so he's exhorting the Corinthian church for many things in 1 Corinthians that he's trying to address, and the latest thing is order in the church and the use of tongues. So, the first note that you have there is number one is desire to prophesy. That's the greatest thing you can do, is to be able to have a prophetic word. This is not fortune telling necessarily, having a crystal ball. This is being able to speak the word of God into people's lives, into the church to encourage and move the church forward. Sometimes, we see in the, even in the New Testament with Agabus that there are prophecies about upcoming famines and things like that so that the church could be prepared. But generally speaking, it's forth telling 
instead of future telling. Speaking the word into people's lives. So we found in chapter 13 that love is the goal in all we do, right? No matter what you do, if you're not motivated by love, then you're clanging cymbals. Like the old toy, the little monkey. Remember that toy? Anybody remember that toy? Paul says that we need to pursue love, but not to, not to neglect seeking spiritual gifts. Because we found in chapter 12 that we all have different gifts that God has given to us for the good of the body. If we don't use our spiritual gifts, it leaves us very anemic. But if we're teaching and leading and showing mercy and praying and prophesying and interpreting tongues and, and planning churches and all these different gifts, it creates a healthy body of Christ. So it's important to seek your spiritual gift. And in fact, at the end of the service, I would love to pray for you that God would impart to you a spiritual gift if you don't already have yours. We, uh, the El, you know, Stu could come up and pray with me and we could pray over you guys because I see Paul doing that in the New Testament. And that's what happened to me years ago. That's why I'm talking in public because God gave me this gift. I did not do this before I was a Christian, I promise you. Um, but I enjoy it because it's a gift he gave me. So Paul is telling here, us here that the best gift to desire is prophecy. A prophetic word edifies, makes you encouraged, exhorts, moves you in a positive direction, challenges you, and consoles you, makes you feel better, right? Tongues spoken without it, without an interpretation, edify the individual. You can see that in Jude 20 to 21. It says, build yourself up in the most holy spirit. I pray in tongues on the way to the beach on Sunday mornings. Like, Lord, please help me bring your word and be accurate. I need your anointing and I ask for that. And so there's a use for that for yourself. And I don't even know what I'm saying, but God does. And I already told you all the story that I heard a I went to a 7-Eleven once and the guy was actually speaking in my prayer, the tongue that I pray, and I spoke my tongue to him to see what I'm saying. Pretty crazy moment, right? And he said it was a dialect from India. So that really encouraged me. Even though I didn't know it, he didn't really understand it, but he had heard it in India. Isn't that wild? There's so many languages. And I was listening to Otani speak in Japanese through his with an interpreter for the Dodger game, and he's speaking so fast in Japanese, the interpreter knows exactly what he's saying. It's like mind-boggling, you know, all these different languages because of the Tower of Babel, right? Otherwise, we'd all be speaking the same language, but that was a problem there. And so now we have uh, different languages. So, but these languages, the tongues are only really known by God when you speak by yourself. They're important when we, when we pray, when we sing, but they're still a mystery to us. So prophecy is the greatest gift. Does that make sense? Okay. Now it's important to note that Paul wishes that all could speak in tongues like him. What does that mean? Not all speak in tongues. I've been to churches where you have to speak in tongues to show that you're saved. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Tongues are a sign of being a believer, right? But it's not the only sign. Um, so keep that in mind because I've been around Pentecostals where they just trying so hard just keep saying I want to buy a Honda, I want to buy a Honda, I want to buy a bow tie until you speak it in tongues, you know? Make sure you're saved. I mean you do have to open your mouth and start saying strange things and it becomes your tongue, let your, but you know, anyway. Uh, but he says I wish all could speak in tongues. Why? Because it builds you up personally. It edifies you and gets you ready for life. When I feel insecure, and I feel like I said something wrong, because I'm a talker, I get a little insecure, I start praying in tongues. It encourages me. I don't know what I'm saying, but God does. So, let's read on. Verses 6 through 12. But now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation, or of knowledge, or of prophecy, or of teaching? Yet even lifeless instruments, whether flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or in the harp? For if the trumpet produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So you too, unless you produce intelligible speech by the tongue, how will it be known 
what is spoken. I just had a thought because uh, everything reminds me of stuff. When I was in Papua New Guinea, the guys were playing the drums for us and they were doing messages that would tell the other village that we want to go to war with you. Or, or they would send a message saying it's safe or whatever. But they actually had messages through their drums that were distinct in tone and, and, and frequency and all that. It was fascinating. So that's what he's talking about. It has to be, you have to distinguish in the sound how you know what it is. So verse 9. So you too, unless you produce intelligible speech by the tongue, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will just be talking to the air. We see a lot of people walking around town doing that, don't we? There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and none is incapable of meaning. So if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be unintelligible to the one who speaks, and the one who speaks will be unintelligible to me. So you too, since you're eager to possess spiritual gifts, strive to excel for the edification of the church. All right, so point number two, seek to edify the church. That's what he's saying here. Whatever you're doing, right? We need to be thinking to ourselves, before I say this, that God just put on my heart, is it going to be an encouraging word for the church? Is this going to be good for the church? Filter, right? I read, I was looking through the internet for like little quips and jokes, and I saw one little Pinterest that said, I need a speed bump between my mind and my mouth because I keep saying all the wrong things, you know? You need to be able to filter and slow down thinking, is this something good for the body of Christ? In addition, our aspirations should be, and this is what I say every day, God, please fill me with your spirit and help me be useful for the Amen. kingdom. Amen. Fill me with your spirit. I was just talking to a friend of mine who was driving by. And he said, I've been spreading the word, but I get so angry sometimes. I said, well, just ask the Holy Spirit to help you with that. He will help you. He wants to help you with that, right? And we should be praying, you know, Lord, use me to be an asset, not a liability. I've also heard about things said lately in the church that are not helpful. Some people didn't hold their tongue or hold their text. And they sent out texts that were hurtful. And then people are left wondering... Well, what's wrong with, what is it? And it's not even specific. It's like this general condemnation. And it hurts the church when some people are walking around wondering, what is it they don't like about me? How can I fix myself if I don't know what it is that needs to be fixed? So please don't just send texts to people that you're bugging me. <laughs> be specific, you know? Like you need deodorant or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> be specific. The Holy Spirit will bring, bring specific conviction. The, the devil will bring general condemnation so that we're rendered useless and we don't even want to talk to anybody so we feel so gross. How many know what I'm talking about? Right? So, it's like, Lord, equip me to serve you and do huge things for you. That's what I've always prayed for. Lord, do things bigger than me. I pray, Lord, use me to stop all the gang problems in L.A. I mean, that's a big prayer. I did that in 1987. I spent two years working with gang members, bringing them to church, lived in the hood, did Bible studies in the projects. Big, I just asked God, use me for something big. I said, Lord, let's do church on the beach. It's huge. My wife and I looked at each other like, what you talking about? How do you do a church, right? And we just take one step at a time, ask the Lord to equip us. Lord, we need to do prison ministry. Help me. So I went into juvenile hall for eight years and I said, Lord, help me. And I went into the day room and I had like 25 criminals in front of me. And Jesus helped me. And I saw so many kids surrender the Lord in Judy at Los Padrinos. Think big. What can I do that's bigger than me so that when people see what I'm doing, they know it's God. Right? Yesterday I prayed, Lord, help me catch waves in the contest. My first two waves gave me first place. I was able to give God glory yesterday. I know I don't want to, some people are like, why do you keep bragging about your surf contest? But it's so cool, they actually gave me the microphone and asked me to talk. So I talked about church on the beach, I talked about God and how he made the waves. So first place has its bonus, you know, has its benefits. So, and so far I'm in first place for the whole season and if I stick with that, I'll have another opportunity at the banquet in the end of the year at the Subaru place to talk again. So. 
Praise the Lord. You know, it's all about what can we do to give God glory, right? All right, so let's look at verse 13, verses 13 and 19. All right, therefore, now why does it say therefore? It's therefore because of the previous statements, right? Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue is to pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, but I will sing with the mind also. For otherwise, if you bless God in the spirit only, how will the one who occupies the place of the outsider know to say the amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you're saying? Right? Let me keep going. For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. See, that's the whole point here. Are they being encouraged? I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Nevertheless, in church, I prefer to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. So how can we edify the church? Now, point number three. Pray that someone may interpret your tongue. This is a wild thing. So if you think that God has given you the interpretation of tongues, and how do you know that? You have to exercise it. You have to actually ask God to give you the gift. He apportions gifts to each of us. And when somebody speaks in tongues, step out by faith and ask God for the interpretation to find out if you have the gift. You won't know unless you use it. Does that make sense? That's what I've been encouraging everybody to do the past few weeks. If you think you have the gift of prayer, then pray for people. You know, I've told y'all before, I, I stepped out and laid my hands on the, the lady at the cash register years ago, and God healed her of a headache she'd had for months. She went dancing around the store celebrating. And I stepped out and at the risk of looking really foolish and laying my hand on the check, the lady at the check register. And God showed me that he wanted to use me to pray for people, right? So you have to step out and do it. So, so show, tell me if you think you have that gift. And then if someone comes to me in our flock and says, I think I have a, t a word that's in my tongue to share. I've only seen this done once at Hope Chapel because most people are scared to do this. It's like, you know, it's kind of risky because you don't want to look foolish. You know, but we're all kind of fools for Christ anyway. I mean, you know. Um, but anyway, so it's, it's, I haven't only seen it done once with Pastor Zach and Alan Kasaka, the worship leader. But it's, it's in the scriptures. It's New Testament. It's part of the gift package. It would be awesome if we could do that. So pray for that. Um, that way someone in our assembly can speak a tongue and encourage the rest of us instead of just hearing babbling. You know, so that we're not in Babylon, right? Um, number four, pray and sing with your spirit and your mind. It's good to pray and sing in the spirit. Look at uh, Romans 8, verse 26. Romans 8, 26 to 27. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So, when you're praying in the Spirit, God will give you things to pray, and you may not even know what you're praying. And sometimes you will. So you pray in your tongue, you pray in your prayer, this, this unintelligible prayer language, or you pray with words. Um, when the, here's a quote. When the Christian's prayers are too deep and too intense for words, when they are rather a sigh heaved from the heart than any formal utterance, then we may know that they are prompted by the Spirit Himself. It is He who is praying to God for us. You know, years ago, I was in Palos Verdes when I lived out there, and... Um, I was praying in the Spirit on the end of a trail overlooking the ocean. 
and I had a vision of an old woman in the Middle East in a black shawl with her hood on. And that was just such a random thing to be thinking about. And so I just believed I was interceding for this woman. I mean, it's pretty wild. I mean, think big. Why not? God's a miraculous God, right? Here's another quote. There are shallow feelings that can be spoken. Language breaks down the attempt in the language breaks down in the attempt to express our deepest emotions and our truest love. Sometimes we're just speechless, right? We don't really quite know how to express how we feel. For all the deepest things in man, inarticulate utterance is the most self-revealing, isn't it? These noises just come out of us when we're just beyond words and you can just tell how someone's feeling by what's coming out of their mouth. Grief can say more in a sob and a tear than in many weak words. Love finds its tongue in the light of an eye and the clasp of a hand. The groanings which rise from the depths of the Christian soul cannot be forced into the narrow framework of human language. Isn't that good? And just because they are unutterable are to be recognized as the voice of the Holy Spirit. So let it go. Trust the Lord. And if you don't, not sure about it, just do it alone. Right? We need to pray and sing in the Spirit. But it's also important to use words so those around you will know what you're doing. When I was in Bolivia last year with, with Stu and Joe, we went down to pray at the end of the church service. And I was praying in tongues. And their church didn't do that as much. And I was praying with words. And the Holy Spirit fell, right, guys? It was so evident. God was moving powerfully. I just stepped out at the risk of look, looking foolish. He said, we have never had a Holy Spirit experience in here like that. Because I just stepped out in faith. Uh, years ago, my friend's um, um, son, who is uh, had Down syndrome, was in the hospital with pneumonia. They were going to take him off the machine and intubate him. And his mother said, come pray for Chris. Come pray in the spirit over Chris. And I went to the to the ICU, went to the hospital there, and prayed in the spirit, not knowing what I'm praying, but by faith, because what his mother asked me to do. And God healed him. He got off the machine and went home. I mean, there's a lot of people praying for him. I don't know if it was just me, but praise God, just do it. What's it? What's it going to hurt? It's a mystery, but it has great results, you know. So. Pretty wild stuff, isn't it? So that's why you read the Bible, because you'll talk about these things, and you're like, what? That's crazy stuff. Well, let's see what the, the owner's manual says, right? Here's another cool quote. I will endeavor to blend all the advantages which can be derived from prayer. I will unite all the benefits which can result to myself and to others. Try it all, right? I deem it of vast importance to pray with the Spirit in such a way that the heart and the affections may be engaged, so that I may myself derive benefit from it. But I also will unite with that utility to others. I will use such language that they may understand it and be profited. Isn't that good? Use it all. Use it all. I've always said, Lord, your way, Yahweh, fill me with whatever you got. I've always gone down to every church service over the last 38 years. When they say come down for prayer, I just run down there. Just whatever you got, I want it. Because I want to be used for the kingdom. How many are feeling that welling up in you right now? And it's kind of scary. and You're not sure whether to let it out. Because God may send you to Africa. Hey, I've been there eight times. It's not bad. The people are great. Okay? What else are you afraid of? He might have me change my job. He might have me, I don't know, whatever it is, like break up with my girlfriend. I don't know. Gnarly stuff. But whatever he does in your life is best. Amen. His boundary lines fall in pleasant places. Amen. We are most, we are our best, as Daniel was talking about at the end of worship. We are our best version of us when we allow God to set up our boundaries. I can't overemphasize that. When we push through those boundaries and, and want to do whatever we want, then you will be walking away from God's blessing in your life. And you're on your own. It's tiresome out there. And it's frustrating. And it's insecure. 
Come on, man. Woo, that's a message in itself. Write that down. Okay, so let's keep reading. Verses 20 to 25. Brothers and sisters, do not be children in your thinking. Come on, grow up. Think about what we're doing here. <laughs> Yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. So be, you know, afraid of evil like a little kid, right? But in your others, otherwise be mature. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me. Okay? That's from Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied that this would happen, right? So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church gathers together and all the people speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're insane? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. Tongues are a sign for unbelievers. I talked to you already about the situation with Jack Hafer. It bears repeating. He was a pastor of church on the way. I used to call it church out of the way because it's in the valley. <laughs> but church on the way. And by the way, he would always break out into song when he preached. He was kind of my example. I'd do that. I also not just feel like singing. And he would do that all the time. He wrote lots of songs. But anyway, but he was on the airplane and he was sitting next to a guy, an unbeliever. And he, God gave him a tongue that was in the guy's language. Hello? Is that cool or what? So he spoke the tongue. The guy knew the language and he was convicted by the Holy Spirit, repented and gave his heart to Christ. Woo! That's how it works. But how are you going to know unless you try? You're just going to sit on the plane and just do your video games on your phone. When I get on the plane, I can't wait to see who's going to sit next to me. Because it's church all the way to Dallas. And you just kind of plan it out as you share the gospel and then you do the ask them to do the sinner's prayer right before you land. And by the way, are you ready for this plane to crash? I am. If you know Jesus, you're not going to be worried about it. Uh, sometimes I've prayed for people in, in Colorado last year. This lady was so anxious, I thought she was going to have a panic attack. And I was praying over here because we had a, a, a newbie, a pilot that never flown before. And he's coming in too low and then gassing it. Uh, and then coming in too low and gassing it. Uh, she was having a cow and I just prayed over her and we made it. She was so grateful. But I always think, you know, if the plane's crashing, the, the it's all set up like a church, right? So I'm just going to unbuckle, run to the front and turn around where the stewardess stands and give the everlasting gospel and lead everybody to Christ before we hit the ground. That's right. I mean, I got a plan. That's I don't right. know about y'all. So... So tongues are a sign for unbelievers, but prophecy is a sign for believers. So, um, years ago, I, I mentioned this before, but I just want to say it again, because some people weren't here. About 30 years ago, no, in 1980, this is a long time ago, 87, 88, 87, long time ago, 37 years ago, my friend Scotty up in Port Wyneme, who was discipling me, I was really eager to just do whatever. I've always, ever since I got filled with the Holy Spirit in 1986, I've been like this. It's so fun. But he just said, Ross, I see you going down this long curve for a long, long time. And then there's a group of people waiting for you. And it was church on the beach. And it took years for that to happen, 18 years ago. So it took like, you know, 20 years for that prophetic word in my life to come true. And I didn't try to make it happen. It just happened, you know? And then years ago when I went to, uh, left for the mission field, I was in the Ukraine for three months and Hawaii and Thailand. My friend Paul Hagazian at Hope Chapel looked at me and he said, set your face like Flint from Isaiah. Set your, or is it Jeremiah? Set your face like Flint, right? 
And when I did that, I did great. But when I didn't do that, I ran into a lot of problems because I kind of wear my feelings on my sleeve. I'm kind of emotional. And that was a word for me. It was a word for me and still a good word. Uh, that we have, you know, just stick to what God has given you and don't look to the right and the left and get distracted or start doubting. You know, keep your hand to the plow. I needed that. It was for me, for sure. Okay, so tongues and prophecy. Now let's keep reading. 26 to 33. We're running out of time. I got to go fast. So what is the outcome then, brothers and sisters? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. All things are to be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it must be by two or at the most three. And each one in turn, and one is to interpret. But there is no interpreter. If, if there is no interpreter, he is to keep silent in the church and have him speak to himself and to God. Have two or three prophets speak, have the others pass judgment, but if a revelation is made to another who is seated, then the first one is to keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. You know what? And I just feel like the Lord is saying, do the rest next week. Because we have a lot to digest right now. And the, the next part is rather controversial. And I, I don't want to just skim it lightly about women in the church. And uh, so I want to make sure I address that accurately and carefully. But you can read it in advance. And you'll be ready for next week. Uh, but so here's the thing, guys. I think this is what God really wants us to know this week. Is that you are a blessing to this world. We're ambassadors. We are a roving embassy for God. And we get to give visas out for heaven. We get to give the visas out. When you go to another country, you have a visa. We have a 10-year visa for Bolivia. So we can go back and get into that country. Okay? How do you get that visa? If you put your trust in Jesus, okay? If you put your trust in Jesus and you ask Him to come into your heart and you believe He rose from the dead and you make Him Lord of your life and you let Him speak into your life and show you your boundaries, your life will change forever. And then if you ask Him to fill you with His Spirit so that you'll be the best version of you ever and do greater things that you could ever do, then life gets great. Going to the grocery store is an experience. It's like could be somebody on aisle five that needs prayer. You know, seriously, that's just how I think. And, and when I'm not thinking that, I, I feel like I get home, I feel like I just missed out on something. I mean, I've for years, I've just thought of creative ways to share the gospel. The latest way is with a surf contest that was all set up here yesterday. You know, what is it that you can do in your sphere of influence this week? Think about where you work, where you go, the stores you go to, even practice with uh, people that call you on the phone, uh, you know, solicitors. They can't touch you. They get mad at you. Practice sharing the gospel with them. And a lot of times when I share the gospel with people on the phone, they really appreciate it because their lives are little, can be a little mundane just talking to people about money and insurance. So I ask him, do you know the, about the best insurance of the land? Jesus Christ, mutual life. The benefits are out of this world. Right? And make it fun, but leave them with something to think about. And so, and ask God, show me your spiritual gift. And at the end of the service, after worship, come forward and I'd love to lay my hands on you with Stu. We'll pray for you. Stu being one of the elders, and we'll, we'll ask God to impart that gift to you so that you can live this wonderful life of adventure. I cannot believe how good life got after I gave my life to Jesus. And I had a pretty good life beforehand. Went to USC, went to UT, went to UCSB, lived in Isla Vista, surfed, saw beautiful everything. Santa Barbara's beautiful everything. Beautiful sunrises, beautiful sunsets, beautiful people, beautiful hiking trails. But it all got better with Jesus. 
all better with Jesus. It's just like a whole new life. So, with everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, you know, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. Open up and I'll come in and sup with you. I'll come in and dine with you. I'll be your friend. I'll have a relationship with you. He wants to solve the sin problem in your life. He died. He actually did solve it at the cross. It's just a matter of recognize it. So if you want to make sure that you're a Christian this morning, and that means a follower of Christ, and know that you're going to go to heaven, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven on earth or when they die. You can see the kingdom of God when you're born again. You have new eyes. So if you'd like to pray with me, raise your hand. I'd love to pray with you today. Today's the day for salvation. Anybody? All right. I don't see any hands up, but it could be a pastor buyer like this guy or other people may need to hear how to pray. So let's all pray what we prayed before. And uh, it could be somebody, somebody in our midst right here is praying it for the first time. So repeat after me, dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Please, forgive me. Please forgive me. Thank you for going to the cross for me. For going to the dying for me. Dying for that excruciating me. death. That excruciating death. I believe you rose again. I believe, I believe you're going to come back for me. I put my trust in you. I want to go to heaven and beat death. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and equip me to love people in the power of your name. Jesus, amen. Let's give the Lord a big clap. Y'all encouraged? It's like a pep rally for Jesus. Need some cheerleaders. Go Jesus, right?